So the passage we're going to look at today is from John 14. It says this. This is Jesus speaking. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So we're thinking about being secure in God's love. And this is interesting, this idea of obedience and love. How many kids here obey everything your parents tell them to tell you to do? Oh, that's, yeah, that's good, yeah. I'm pretty sure my kids do. Like, there's no question they will always be obedient. See, this, this kind of thing, is there a transactional thing with God's love? This is what we often think, and this kind of seems to suggest it. If you're obedient, then, then you'll have the love. And it's kind of like there's some kind of performance you have to obey to uh, earn God's love. And I want to, I've got this, look at this for an amazing visual aid. This is a scales, <laughs> perfectly balanced. Uh, and on it, we have, uh, we have God as a God of love, who loves us. And on the other end of the scales, we have God as the judge, who is judging us. And we can have this sense of these two elements of God that we can find quite contradictory. And we might look, Actually, I'm fairly sure this isn't going to work unless I put this into the stand. We can have this idea of God as, uh, he's quite judging. This is how he relates to us. He's judging what we're doing. He's looking, are we obedient? Are we living up? So we can feel maybe if we're <laughs> reading, you know, and especially maybe we're reading the Old Testament, we think, oh, God was really judgy. He's always like, smiting people and things like that. And then maybe we think, well, we need to balance it, so let's look at the New Testament a bit and we'll put some, we'll do some emphasis on this. Uh, and we're trying to get a balance. And uh, there's this other thing that maybe if you've been around church for a while, you might have felt, when you were young, it was like, every, like the emphasis was on you need to live this certain way, do these things right, be obedient. And then when you kind of grow up, you think, I don't think God's like that. So you kind of then think, no, I just think he's a loving God. And this is kind of like not, not really true. And I just want to think about God being a loving God. And often if you do that, I think after a while, you can just get a bit apathetic about God's you kind of end up a bit agnostic about who God is. So I want to think, how do these fit together? How does God treat us? Is he, is he really a God of love or is he judging our obedience? And like this. So we're thinking of these as a balance. So one thing I would say is if we're thinking, if we have done that thought sometimes, well, what, what do I think God's like? What would I like God to be like? If we, if we believe God is exactly the as we would want that suits us. We want God to be nice, loving God. The reality is if we have a God that suits all of our desires, all of our wants and, and what we feel our needs are and fits perfectly with that, it can't be God. God can't fit everybody's individual needs. God is just God. And so we should expect to have a God who challenges us, who uh, goes against what we might naturally want at times. But the reality is this doesn't work because in this thing, what we're thinking is there's this quality called love and God has a lot of it. He might even have the most of it. And then there's this quality of kind of being judgmental and judging and God might have some of it or whatever. It doesn't work like that because um, God is fully both. Emmeline, can you come and help me? Because I'm just going to drop these again. Can you, can you take some of the... Um, marbles and put them in this bag. Actually, hold the bag with one hand and then you can grab those ones because if you don't grab them at the same time, it's all going to go. There we go. So what I want to say is this understanding Wonderful. Wait, wait, I need you just to say, this understanding doesn't work. This is wrong. But the problem is I've given you a visual aid and we're such visual creatures that you are not going to remember what I said, but you're going to remember, oh, do you remember? It's like a scale. So what we need to do is do a stronger visual aid about why it's not right. 
Emmeline, can you kick it over? Go on, just go, go crazy. No, not hard enough. Okay, fantastic. Right, and actually... Uh, Emmeline, thank you. That's, sorry, you've done now. Thank you. Round of applause for Emmeline's kicking powers. Uh, Brill, yeah, if you can put it in, that'd be great. You smashed the visual aid there, thank you. I hope this works. I oh, yes. So, uh, this, is, this is better understanding what God's like because God is both fully love and fully righteous judgment. So there is no external quality where God is a bit, has some of that or most of that. The definition of love is found in God. God is love. And the definition of righteousness, of what's the right way to live, is God as well. So he is fully both at the same time, which feels like a contradiction. But it's important we understand that because if God is a God of love, that is terrible news for the world. And if God is the righteous judge, and only the righteous judge, that is terrible news for us. Or to put it the other way, if God is only a God of love, there is no hope for the world. If God is only the God of righteous judgment, there is no hope for us. He has to be both. So you think about it, think about, is there, if we, if we want to say, well, I think God is just all loving, all accepting, all forgiving, is there anybody anywhere in the world right now doing something that we think God would be, should be angry about? Do we think that God just should be lovingly accepting about everything that's going on? Of course not, you only have to open the newspapers, you only have to look at our own lives to understand that there is evil in the world, there are awful things going on, that we want justice for. And of course, what we tend to do is think, well, those are evil things. And then there is this line, those are evil things God should be angry about and judge. And there's this line where God should be loving and forgiving. Oh, and look, I'm on this side of the line. In fact, this side of the line is just where I am. And even if I move a bit towards evil, you know, like, I mean, it was only, it was only a little bit of, uh, you know, stationary from work and, that expenses claim, it kind of balanced stuff out. Even if we, the line kind of moves with us, that's what's always going on. And of course, if God is perfectly righteous, then anything is bad. So that's, so if, if it's love and everyone gets off with everything, that's bad news for the whole world. In fact, if you read the Psalms, the Psalmists are often, they don't think of judgment as personal, they think of it as the world system. And they're saying, God, won't you come and judge the world, please? Come and judge the world because there's so much evil in the world. We want you to sort it out. So that's, we want that. But then also when we realise that judgment is not good for us, then we think, no, but I want a God of love as well. Because I, I know there's evil in me. I can't be judged by that. So we need both things and how they fit together. And look at the rest of this verse. It says this. Uh, Obey my commandments to remain in my love. And I've told you this so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Obedience and, and even the love is a means to the end of discovering what it is to be fully alive, to be fully human, full of joy. And that's what these two aspects of God are doing, that God is perfectly the righteous judge and perfectly love, and they come together in Jesus to save us. So Jesus goes to the cross, he comes and lives, God comes and lives as a human being, experiences the whole range of human emotions and human condition, is tortured and executed, and it says that all of our wrongdoings were put on Jesus at that point. And so God is a perfect righteous judge and he carries out judgment on Jesus. So there's a whole thing about, do you remember the earth is covered in darkness and Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? God's turned his back on Jesus. That is judgment coming on Jesus. But it's because of love that Jesus does that. He comes and does that because he loves us so much. He wants to take our uh, wrong stuff away from us 
so that we can be restored to relationship with him. And so what you have is God's love, he comes as Jesus and he dies for us, and then God's justice. So at judgment, you say, look, all these things you've done wrong, there needs to be a punishment for that. And Jesus says, but I've paid that punishment. And if, you are, if we're going to be righteous, we can't take payment for the same thing twice. It's already been paid and I've paid it. So as we move towards thinking about the age to come, sometimes we can think, well, am, do, am I saved? Am I going to get into heaven? Am I going to get to go to the age to come? If you are in Jesus, judgment has already been passed on you in Jesus. It's already been passed. Because these two things, God's love and God's righteous judgment, come together. And it leaves us in a position where we realise that we are sinners worthy of judgment, which makes us humble. But then we realise that God loved us so much, he would, uh, he would do all this stuff, he would die for us, which makes us feel amazing. So we're in this place of humble but emboldened in God's presence. <laughs>